good morning, church family. How is everyone today? Cold. You know, they got a couple inches of snow up in Idaho where I'm from, and it's still there. And so you don't know how much I miss the cold. And that when I come here and people say they're cold, I'm not saying they're wrong. <laughs> I just have a hard time wrapping my head around that. But I, what a pleasure it is to have you all in this wonderful, warm building that the Lord has blessed. And we actually, we only have two more sermons in Romans. We have today... And then next Sunday, which will really be uh, a flyover of the whole book to tie it all together. Because for the last couple months, we've had lots of little broken up chunks and sections of it. And next Sunday, I would like to do a whole sermon where I just pull all together to give a good recap. And this is what Romans is all about. about the gospel the righteousness of God revealed to bring salvation to all who believe first to the Jew then to the Gentile by faith as it was written the righteous will live by faith and as we move on to today if you have your Bible please crack that bad boy open to Romans I, I don't know if it's right to call the Bible a bad boy like you know, <laughs> go ahead, crack open that bad boy. Like, I mean, it's the holy living word of God, so it's a good boy. <laughs> but if you have your Bible, open that, that book up. If you have the Bible app on your phone, pull up Romans, because that's where we're going to be today. Chapter 14 is where we're going to be starting. But before I get into the text, what I wanted to talk about is what a shame it is and shame is me using a word very shallow to say what a shame it is when a church gets ripped apart by something small. And ministers swap stories. Because I'm a minister, I talk with other ministers, I go to minister conferences, and I have heard a lot of horror stories where something small ripped a church apart. And for me, as, as someone who wasn't there, I'm like, your church really split over how you collected tithes and offerings? Like, that was enough to rip your church apart. And you don't say that because the guy's broken, you know. But... You think it's so small and insignificant, but to them, it was huge. Enough for them to say, I break my fellowship with you. I cannot worship in the same building as you. I cannot worship next to you. So, we have a lot of examples of it. I've seen people, um, well, I don't like the worship. I don't like this. I, I don't like that. And when you look at it and break it down, it always seems so small compared to, I can no longer fellowship with you. Because that's a pretty big leap. I mean, and even to take it into the context of big C, little c, and when I say big C, little c, what I mean by that is we are the little c church, Willamina Christian Church. But we are a part of the big C, which is the church, the body of Christ, which our neighbors across the street, they're worshiping today as the body of Christ. Um, the Methodists down the road, brothers and sisters in Christ, whom we might not be worshiping in the same building, but we still have fellowship with them, that they are our brothers and sisters in Christ. We're all part of the big C church. And even then, we can let stylistic differences, because we're in the United States of America, where we have a little bit of everything represented, so you really can find and say, okay, you know, I like this, I like that, and that's not breaking fellowship. 
breaking fellowship is when we say, I cannot worship with you any longer. That's what it means to break fellowship. And it has always been an issue in Christianity since the very beginning. So many of Paul's letters he is writing saying, you have let this issue break your unity. Let me explain to you how this issue needs to be resolved. And a lot of the time there are some things that are non-negotiable. Like in Colossae when they say that Jesus Christ was a created being, that he was adopted by God but was not God in flesh. I mean, these are the things where we have to come in and say, no, we, we can't believe that. We have to believe that Christ is God in flesh, 100% God, 100% man, who is the only path to salvation. I mean, Paul writes to these people over things that they're big issues, and those need to be examined and brought forth. But then there are little issues. Do we have pews or chairs? You would be amazed how much time that, <laughs> that gets brought up and discussed in church meetings. And that's the whole heart of today's sermon. What do we do with the little things? The little things that we don't always agree with. The little things where we look at our brother or sister in Christ and they worship in such a way that we think to ourselves either they're not doing it enough or they're doing it too much. And that's the heart of today's sermon. So please read with me. All right, there we go. And if my slide watchers could click along for me so that I can just read, that'd be great. <clears throat> Romans chapter 14, verse 1. Accept the one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. One's person's faith allows them to eat anything. But another whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. The one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not, and the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does, for God has accepted them. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To their own master, servants stand or fall, and they will stand, for the Lord is able to make them stand. One person considers one day more sacred than another. Another considers every day alike. Each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. Whoever regards one day as special does so to the Lord. Whoever eats meat does so to the Lord, for they give thanks to God. And whoever abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us live for ourselves alone, and none of us dies for ourselves alone. If we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or die... We belong to the Lord. For this very reason, Christ died and returned to life so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. You then, why do you judge your brother or sister? Why do you treat them with contempt? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord. Every knee will bow before me. Every tongue will acknowledge God. So then, each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. So therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or sister. I am convinced, being fully persuaded in the Lord Jesus, that nothing is unclean in itself. But if anyone regards something as unclean, then that, for that person it is unclean. If your brother or sister is distressed because of what you eat, you are to do no longer acting in love. Do not by your eating destroy someone for whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let what you know 
is good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit, because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and receives human approval. Let us therefore make every effort. I'm going to say that again. Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and mutual edification. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All food is clean, but it is wrong for a person to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. It is better not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything else that will cause your brother or sister to fall. So whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who does not condemn himself by what he approves, but whoever has doubts is condemned if they eat because their eating is not from faith and everything that does not come from faith is sin. We who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of us should please our neighbors for their good, to build them up. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it was written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through the endurance taught in the scripture and the encouragement they provide may have hope. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had. So with one mind and one voice, oh, you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Accept one another. Just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God, for I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth, so that the promises made to the patriarchs might be confirmed, and moreover, that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy as it is written. Therefore, I will praise you among the Gentiles. I will sing the praises of your name. And again it says, Rejoice, you Gentiles, with his people. And again, Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Let all peoples extol him. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will spring up, one who will arise to rule over the nations, and in him the Gentiles will have hope. That was a lot of scripture. But I decided to read all of it because how do you choose what two or three verses to pull out of that. That was a long chunk, but it has a very important message about unity. And the thing about unity is there's really two ways to view unity. You can take the first view and say, unity is more important than any doctrinal stance. And then we come to this place where we say it is more important that we are together than apart. And so I will make concessions to doctrinal truth. And that is not what Paul is talking about here. We do not achieve unity at the expense of essential doctrine. So when we look at this, what Paul is talking about in this passage, in this context, to this people, is he has two groups of people. He has the Jewish converts, and he has the Gentile converts. Now, the Jewish converts have in their lifetime lived before Messiah. So in their life, there was a time before Christ when you lived, and you lived under Jewish law which meant there was food that was clean, there was food that was unclean, there were holy days, there were days where you were required by Torah to go to the temple to make sacrifices. They had holidays, they had holy days that they had to go and observe. You had to face in a certain direction when you prayed. You had to wear certain clothes, you had to wear them in a certain way. The Gentiles had none of those things. <laughs> they had extreme liberty because the gods that they conjured up for themselves required no real discipline. I mean, really. You just would go to the temple and do whatever you wanted. I mean, there were some pretty, pretty scandalous temples. 
And so when they came to the Lord, they come in, and now here are these Jewish Christians who say, you can no longer eat pork. And they say, I have been eating pork my whole life. You're wrong. And now we have an issue. Is that one to divide and split over? When Christ has pronounced all food clean. And that's really at it. Is this passage, Paul's using examples of his day. Dietary restrictions and holy day observances. Now, this is a dispute that we feel has long been settled, being 2,000 years removed from whether or not we can eat shellfish. We can. But at the time when Paul wrote this, churches were splitting over that. And we have our own set of of divisive non-issues. How do we dress on Sunday? You'd be surprised how many churches have a, uh, have a dress code that they don't bring up. They don't tell you as you come into church, they say, hey, uh, you know, sorry, sir, this is, a, this is a shirt and tie establishment. And we've got some coats hanging up in the back we'll lend you, but if you're going to, you know, return, this is our dress code. They, they kind of don't say that. What they do is they look at you and they shake their heads. What about ball caps? Is it okay to wear a hat in church? Why or why not? But see, these are the things that you might be going, oh, of course you can wear a hat in church. God doesn't care if you wear a hat unless you talk to my mom. <laughs> and I have been slapped in the back of the head most of my life in church. Because I, out of like obstinate defiance, like refused to take my hat off because I'm sitting in the funeral. I'm like, God doesn't care if I wear a hat. And my mom goes, I care if you wear a hat. So, you know, to you, this might be like, well, that's, well, for me, hats was a big deal. But that's my point. We can take something small and blow it out of proportion and turn it into something divisive. So we have things like non-issues about dress codes, but to the Mennonites and the Seventh-day Adventists, these are big deals. What holy day do we worship on? Well, according to the Seventh-day Adventists, if you're not worshiping, worshiping on Saturday, which was the day that the Jews worshiped, well, you are clearly not saved because you are violating God's law that says worship on the Sabbath. You're not worshiping on the Sabbath. So therefore, how can your worship be valid? God will not hear your prayers and you're going straight to hell, you dirty heathen. We giggle, but I've met some pretty hardcore SDAs. There was a strong Mennonite presence in Sandpoint. And in that religious code, those women have to sew their own dresses in order to meet the mandates, they say, of Proverbs 31. So they have to sew their own dresses together, and they have to always wear a head covering because they point to a piece of scripture that says a woman is not to have her head uncovered, and they say, obviously, this is God's rule in this law, so... Well, when we go to Walmart, my husband can buy some Levi's, but I have to go to the sewing section and sew my own dress together because that's what the Bible says. So I'm using examples for us like dress code and ball caps because this is an easy way for us to like, oh, this isn't an issue in our church, but to bring to light that it is an issue in many churches that becomes what I would consider a divisive non-issue. I have been called out on when baptizing, do I pray in Jesus' name or in the name of the Trinity? I've baptized people and had someone come up to me afterward and say, um, you know, you didn't baptize him in the name of Jesus. And I said, well, I did. I said, in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And they say, well, you didn't say, in Jesus' name, I baptize you. You didn't really baptize that person. 
I'm like, buddy, <laughs> you know, I think you're missing it. But these are the little things that can tear a church apart that we look at and go, why? What a shame. What a shame for that to be something that tears a church apart. And like I said, unity should never be attained through the compromise of essential doctrine. And there may be more of those than you think. Doctrine does matter. What you believe does matter. This sermon has, has no part of it that says that we compromise essential doctrine in the name of unity. But we talk about these things about how we dress and how we observe and, and how, we, how we walk in our faith. And Paul's talking about there's a strong and a weak faith. What's he talking about here? What's it mean to be the one who is strong in faith versus the one who's weak in faith? I mean, obviously, the one who's strong in faith is the one who is whipping themselves at home and... Um, abstaining from food and starving themselves and walking to the tops of mountains wearing no shoes. Like, obviously, that's the one who's strong in faith, right? But what connotates a strong and weak faith? Because the answer might surprise you that that person who is living, the word that we use is ascetic. And an ascetic lifestyle is one where you bring on intentional hardships to try and grow your faith. And there is a place for it in Christian community. I'll use for an example, fasting. I fast every Sunday morning because it's a ritual that I have gotten into the habit of that I, and it's deeper than wanting to preach on an empty stomach. I'm fasting on Sunday morning. I'm not required to by law, but I do it because I think it helps me. So that's a form of ascetic lifestyle because I get hungry on Sundays. But the strong and the weak faith is I do it because I, I like it. I think it helps me, but I never tell you to do it. So rules and asceticism are not in, uh, of themselves spiritual because legalism does not equal righteousness. To follow rules upon rules upon rules just for the sake of following rules is not equal to righteousness. Holiness, righteousness, life through the Spirit, these are the things that produce good fruit, whether you are living an ascetic lifestyle or not. Whether you fast on Sunday morning or not, if you are living in the light and love of the Spirit, your life is going to bear the good fruit that comes from that. So whether or not we're fasting on Sundays or walking up mountains barefoot to shiver in the cold to try and have some religious experience becomes a non-issue. Because to the person who will put themselves through hardship in order to have a religious experience, if they're doing it in faith, then the Lord will bless them. But for the one who stays home and, and is in a nice warm couch environment with a, a belly of food, if they're doing it to the Lord, then they will be blessed. Legalism does not equal righteousness. Because the answer is religion, not relationship. Wait. Ooh, I wrote that backwards in my notes. <laughs> but the answer is relationship, not religion. That's the answer to, to this whole faith issue. Is the one who is weak in faith is the one who is trying to earn God's love and God's good graces because that's at the heart of all these religious practices that we try and observe is we are trying so hard, so desperately, 
to earn or win God's approval. And that's a weak faith. And I say that with no judgment. Because I know what it's like to be desperately trying to claw your way up God's mountain because you just want to feel okay. And you'll do anything to try and please God so that, so that you'll be blessed. I've been there, and I know what it's like. I know what it's about. So I'm not judging anyone when I say that when you work acts of religion to try and earn God's approval, it is a sign of a weak faith. Because the one who is strong in faith knows that God loves them unconditionally all the time. God's love endures forever. You don't have to earn God's love and approval. And when you're walking in faith, you will be compelled to walk in righteousness. Life in the Spirit, I preached on this a few, a few Sundays ago, life in the Spirit makes sin seem unappealing. We naturally start doing the things that God wants us to be doing out, out of our own renewed heart and renewed spirit. So we don't have to say, if I don't cover my head in church, the Lord will not be happy with me and He won't bless me. If I don't go to my Wednesday night prayer group, God will not bless me. If I don't start volunteering in the church nursery, God will not bless me. I mean, what is it? I'm just kind of pulling things out of the top of my mind, but what are we trying to do to earn God's blessings and His good graces? when those things cannot be earned, but they are freely given. What an odd paradox that is. It can not be earned. It can only be received through faith. And the issue that's dealt with in this passage is not gauging who, or not who has a strong and a weak faith. That's not what this passage is about. I've been winding up all this just to put it into perspective to say, when I say strong faith and weak faith, what am I talking about? The issue that divides churches is not that people have strong and weak faiths. The issue is how we deal with those people. Because I have seen it happen. What happens is one group says, I live this way of life, you do not, therefore I am more holy than you, and because you are not doing these things, you are dragging down the hole, and God is going to punish the church because you don't fast on Sunday. You don't go to Wednesday night prayer group, you don't volunteer in the nursery, and because of you, the Lord is going to judge us harshly. So shame on you. I just like doing that. <laughs> I don't really shame on any of you. I mean, I really, no shame. Um, it's just as fun. So, <laughs> but then the other side goes, you don't understand. I have liberty in Christ. I have liberty. I don't have to do these things to earn God's love and approval because God loves and approves of me just as I am. I do my best. I read my Bible when I feel compelled to read my Bible. I pray when I feel compelled to pray. And I am in good conscience and good standing with the Lord. I'm doing my best, and the Lord has blessed me. And you're working yourself silly. So shame on you. That's the real issue here. It's when the weak in faith are unsure of boundaries, so they build fences, and those fences box them in. 
And then they look out and they see their fellow Christians outside the bounds they built for themselves and they start to judge. They must be wrong because they're not following a rule of life as strict as mine. And on the other side, the Christians who are strong in faith look at the self-walled-in Christians and say, what silliness is this? I'm going to dance around just to stir the pot. Maybe not everybody does that, but I sure do. So, what do we do about this? How do we as a church live in unity in light of the different ways that people respond to their faith? Inside this passage, there's really three easy things. Remember that your primary allegiance is to Jesus Christ. Let's start there. That is your primary allegiance. So, if you have that piece locked in, dialed in, and you're saying, my allegiance is to Jesus Christ, then you're going to look at your brother and sister and say, their allegiance is to Jesus Christ. Because remember, we're not talking about main doctrinal issues here. Because with those, absolutely, we have to sit down and talk about them. We're talking about little things. So if I am a millennialist, which means I don't believe that Jesus Christ, when he returns for the second coming, which I do believe Jesus Christ will return for his second coming, but is there going to be seven years of trial and tribulation? Is there going to be people taken away and for seven years everyone who's left down below are going to have to go through this hard time? I'm an amillennialist. I think Jesus Christ is going to come back and, and that'll be that. But there are people who have different interpretations of Revelation than me. Who do believe that the second coming of Christ is going to be a great and terrible thing. And that we need to be con concerned about those people who will be left down below for seven years. Now, we're both aligned to Jesus Christ. We both believe that Jesus Christ will return. And everything beyond that non-issue. I mean, really. I have known many people who disagree with how Revelation is going to go down, but we still go to the table of the Lord together and break bread and fellowship and love because our primary allegiance is to Jesus Christ. So when we remember that, we don't judge because we're all going to be judged by Christ. So whoever's right, whoever's wrong, Jesus is going to sort all that out. You need to be focused on your own walk, not the walk of your neighbor. Don't focus on what they're doing. Focus on what you're doing. And if we just do that, <laughs> I mean, like, the rest really sorts itself out. But there is more. And that, okay, so we're focused on, on me. I'm focused on my walk. I'm focused on what am I going to say when I go before the judgment seat of Christ and trying to make it to where the Lord says, well done, good and faithful servant. I mean, really, that's all I'm shooting for. What's the next step? And the next step is don't judge, empower. That as we look at our brothers and sisters around the room, as we look at our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world, don't judge these people. Empower them. Those who are strong in faith, don't judge those who are weak in faith. Love them. Help them. Guide them. Direct them. Don't judge. That's what Jesus' job is, not ours. Don't put a stumbling block in the path of those who are in this weak faith if we start judging them, we start condemning them, we start slapping them over the head with Scripture, well, now our camp looks horrible. And they're not going to want to have anything to do with it. If we're convinced that we have freedom, and it offends a brother and sister in Christ, don't do it. I'll give you an example. This is a real world, real life example here. 
To my own chagrin, I am convinced that if there is no traffic, I am not required to stop at stop signs. <laughs> and I thought about whether or not to preach on that last Sunday when we talked about following the rules of law of the country, and I decided I'll leave that one alone. But I have a, a pretty good no cop, no stop policy. And truth be told, this is where my heart is, is I believe stop signs are there to promote the healthy, safe flow of traffic. So when I'm driving and there are other cars, I absolutely stop at stop signs. Why? Because it's safe and they're there so that people who come to intersections know whose turn it is to go and we can all get where we're going in a safe and orderly fashion and no one gets in car accidents if they just follow those rules and laws. So when I'm driving up and I see someone, I'm like, okay, stop sign, like, er, stop, they go, okay, I go. But when I'm driving home at night and I look around and there's not another car on the road, I'm like, I'm not going to let that piece of metal tell me how to drive, you know. <laughs> and so I just roll on by and I have never been in an automobile accident. And <laughs> for those at home, someone just gave me one of these guys. And maybe, maybe that's deserved. I don't know. Don't judge me. But, <laughs> but here's where I'm going with this for a real world example was last Thursday, a BBC rep who I went to school with, so we're friends. We know each other outside of, of um, him coming to rep for the college at church, and I was laughing with him about this no cop, no stop policy because I was talking about how I just preached on Romans 13. So he's following me to my house, and this is when I went, well, because I kind of wanted to get him used to this no cop, no stop idea, and I didn't stop at any of the stop signs. Did I make him uncomfortable? Did I, as I'm pulling him through these things, have I tested his conscience? And I don't feel like I need to call him up and apologize to him, but I did wake up the next day and reach the conclusion that that was wrong of me. Because I pushed in such a way that I may have encouraged him to violate his own conscience. And that's the sin whether or not stop signs, if, if you're driving in a desert road and there's no one around for miles and you don't stop at a stop sign, have you sinned? I'm convinced in my mind, no, don't stop at that stop sign. That's, you don't need to. I'm convinced. But for me to pull other people through that stop sign who are not convinced would violate their conscience and now I have put a stumbling block in their heart. And that is a sin. When I see Mennonites at Walmart, because that's the only place I ever see them, I just want to tell them, God bless you. God bless your devotion. God bless your heart for Christ. God bless that you love God and you worship the Lord and you pray and you read the word and we will be united in God's kingdom. Even SDAs, Thank God for you. They're doing their thing. They're reaching the lost for Christ. Are there going to be people in heaven who we can celebrate the Lord with together who are SDA? Absolutely we are. So I'm not going to go around slapping them down. I'm not going to join their church. But <laughs> I'm not going to judge them. I'm not going to look down my nose at them. That's not my place. I'm not here to judge. I'm here to empower. So if you're convinced you have freedom and your brother and sister is offended and you keep going, your, vi your freedom has violated Christian conscience and you have hindered the faith. And here's the last point is make every effort towards peace for mutual edification. 
one word can make a big difference, and that word is every. Make every effort. It doesn't say make an effort. It doesn't say make effort until you get frustrated. It says make every effort towards peace for mutual edification. I mean, that one word, am I being honest or am I being rigorously honest? One word changes the whole dynamic of it. Are we making every effort towards peace? Well, I've gone on long enough. (laughs) The idea, brothers and sisters, behind all this, we're all going to be in our own place in our faith walk. We're all going to be living out our Christian conscience to the best that we can. And our job is not to look around and become the sin police or the religious police. Our job is to walk in faith the best we can to not violate our conscience or the conscience of our brothers and sisters. Walk in the Lord and build each other up. Not judging one another and tearing each other down. All for the glory of God. Holy Spirit of the living God, thank you for this day. Thank you for the blessings that you have poured out into our hearts and in our lives. I pray, God, that you would bring unity to us, that we would know that you are alone, God, and be united in our faith towards you. I pray that you would give us liberty in the places where there is liberty, and I pray that you would galvanize us in the places where there is only one way and one truth. And may we be unified in that way and that truth. And may we have love and charity in all others. In Jesus' holy and precious name, amen.